November 8, 1950, in the quiet neighborhood of Hampton Road, a picturesque three-story home sits ways from the roadway. A young 31-year-old mother sits atop the roof of the home. Inside is her husband and four children. A member of the house staff called for help, seeing her sitting out there. Fear racked the seven-year-old little boy who was now awake thanks to his father's insistence to come and see what mommy was doing. The wind swayed the trees out in front of the home and the chill of the fall air blanketing the quiet town of Scarsdale. With first responders on scene, one talking softly to the young woman, hoping to coax her down from where she had been perched, quote, I want you to stay put, I'm coming to get you. The other fireman putting a ladder up to the garage roof close to where she was sitting. She insisted that she was fine and the need for them was uncalled for. Inside, her eldest son watched, wanting to know why mommy was sitting out on the roof. Too young to understand that she suffered from depression and possibly paranoia, something his father had been discussing with police that had arrived before the firemen. But he was old enough to recognize the danger of her being out there and what the outcome could be. Many question the recollection of the young boy. Did his father really insist that he climb out of bed to see what his mother was doing? Or did he wake to see it all on his own? Maybe, possibly, his memory is only that of the stories that those tell of that night. As the firemen began to climb the rungs of the ladder, the young mother continued to protest his presence. She raised to her feet her nightgown and robe blowing and swaying with the bare branches of the trees. Firemen pleading for her to sit down so she could come down without any injury. Her foot inched to the edge with little hesitation. The look down proved that she was high enough that if she fell, she could die. Suddenly, the fireman who was still climbing the rungs reached out and snagged the belt of her robe. But with her falling weight, it wasn't enough to stop what was already in motion. Neighbors watched from where they stood, curious of the commotion going on in their neighbor's home. Her husband and son watched as she disappeared from the roof. And what everyone present feared, what happened, did. A sickening thud heard by those gathered around. Paramedics would declare the young mother of four and wife of a wealthy real estate tycoon dead. Was it an accident? Was she just wanting to see over the edge and lost her footing? Or did she end up leaping to her death out of hopes of ending the vicious cycle of depression? Many speculated what they believed to be true. The young boy feels that he watched his mother take her life, but could never grasp the reason why. What father would insist on his son watching his mother fall to her death? What child would insist that these were the events of that night in November? Is it possible that the young boy heard the details of what happened that night and created a reality in which he could see come to life? A boy who loved his mother so? Is it possible that losing her at a young age and in a way that no child should lose a parent caused his own mentality to break and create a monster capable of taking the life of another? Taking the life of his wife? The life of his best friend who would and did everything he asked of her? taking the life of a neighbor who knew his name and could take his freedom in one phone call. A serial killer from one of the most prominent families in America rose from the ashes of that night, November 8, 1950. And his story took the world by storm. He got away with it for so long, but it would be the daughter of a notorious gangster, his best friend, and her family that would bring him down and reveal the ugly secret of the Durst family. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. 
I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we kick off season four with a case that hit its 40th anniversary, and we know the same as they did in 1982. Kathy Durst thought that she had met the man that she would marry and build a long life with. What she got was nothing more than a grown child for a husband. His little organic grocery store was it for him. He didn't want to join the corporate world, even though his father wanted nothing more than that. Now, this beautiful woman has been missing for 40 years. The man we all know and suspect had something to do with her disappearance finally went home to meet his maker. No amount of wealth or social status will keep him from answering for what he did while he walked this world. And many believe justice for Kathy will never come. But maybe it wasn't our duty to punish him. Maybe he would answer with the bigger picture. Money doesn't buy happiness, but neither does committing murder. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of domestic violence, murder, and adult language. Listeners' discretion is advised. If you feel as though any of this will be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good freaking evening, all of my true crime nerds. It has been a long break, but one that I was in desperate need for. I hope you all enjoyed the holiday only to write out a very eventful January. A few points to cover in the housekeeping tonight. Patreon launched this last month with some behind the scene looks and an all new bonus show, The Librarian After Dark. If you haven't found the page, the link is located on my Facebook page. Go check it out, and from there, select the perfect tier for you. Like always, you can head over to thetruecrimelibrarian.com and you can shop for merch, see about past episodes, and even support the show with a one-time donation. If you want to help without a dime leaving your pocket, Review and recommend the show. This is a great way to trick that algorithm into recommending the show to other nerds just like yourself. Let's go ahead and spread some of that true crime nerd love to Miss Shelly Dixon. She was the very first patron on Patreon. If you want to add your name to the list, head over to Patreon and do so now. Now, let's get to what you all came here for, the true crime. Okay, let me introduce you to the man, the myth, and unfortunately, the legend, Robert Allen Durst, not to be confused with Fred Durst, and believe me, it happens more frequently than you would think. Robert, or Bob, Durst was born April 12, 1943. He's the eldest son of Seymour and Bernice Durst. Robert's grandfather, Joseph, was an immigrant from Austria-Hungary and was a tailor and went to become an extremely successful real estate manager and developer, finding Durst Organization in 1927. One World Trade Center, constructed in 2014, is owned by the Durst Organization today. The original World Trade Center's were destroyed in the attacks on the United States on September 11, 2001. These were owned by Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, so not to be confused with the Twin Towers, 
One World Trade Center, the building standing in the general area of the trade centers, is two totally different buildings. In 1950, when Robert was just seven years old, Bernice jumped to her death at the family's home in Scarsdale. There is some speculation on what happened between Seymour and Robert. Robert claims that his father woke him up and told him to come and see mommy. Robert walked to the room to see his mother out on the roof of the home, not truly understanding what was going on, but remember hearing his father telling him to watch her. Well, moments later, she jumps, falls to her death. It's not, it's ruled a suicide, but they, there's some question on whether she accidentally fell or she forced herself over the edge. If this is in fact the case, his father woke him up to make him watch his mother jump to her death, then that raises a lot more questions between what was mentally going on in Robert and Seymour's relationship. However, if the opposite happened and Robert happened to witness his mother jump to her death or even see the aftermath and not see the actual jumping part, this would not explain away, but it would bring to light some of the developing issues he has later on in life. Robert was the eldest, followed by Douglas, Wendy, and Thomas, I do believe is the order. But the relationship between Robert and Douglas was strained from the get-go, and it lasted up until Robert's death just a few weeks ago. Robert and Douglas were sent to counseling early in their in their life due to their very intense sibling rivalry. It was getting so bad at the time in 1953, they just, Seymour could no longer just keep a hand on his kids, and he he didn't ever remarry, so he took care of them on his own, probably with help of the staff and everything, but you can see there was something clearly wrong between these two boys. And psychologists at the time in 1953, when Robert was just 10 years old, they were already starting to see some signs and symptoms of mental disorders. Well, you know, it's a very taboo subject, so they're still learning it because it's like testing today with marijuana. It's illegal, and federally in the United States, it's still illegal. So testing is very difficult. It's very difficult to prove that it does have some benefits to certain ailments and possibly to the very concerning financial status of the United States. But it's so taboo that we're not really letting anybody look into it. Think of that, but take it to 1953. That's what mental health was. We couldn't study it really because People were reluctant to even come forward and admit there was an issue. But Robert at 10, they're already seeing some signs and it's concerning. He has personality decomposition and schizophrenia. This explains a lot. Does not explain away what he did, but it explains away how he handled it. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and make that a point right here and now. Uh, no matter what is wrong or was or was not or whatever with Robert Durst, it does not excuse what he did, okay? So schizophrenia would explain some of the off-the-wall antics in Robert, and we would see these become increasingly awkward as he gets older. And if there were voices inside of his head instructing him to do something, it could give us a stepping stone kind of to see where this all came from. But like I said, not the lone or understandable excuse. Now, Robert attended high school where he was labeled very much a loner and awkward and different. In 1965, Robert graduated with his bachelor's degree from Lee University, and from there, he was on the lacrosse team. He was the business manager of the Brown and White, the university newspaper, so he had some pretty good um, extracurricular points on his record. He enrolls in UCLA in 1965 into 
the doctoral program, but he would return home and withdraw in 1969. While enrolled at UCLA, Robert met Susan Berman, and the two became best friends from almost the moment they met. Susan would go on to be an accomplished author who embraced her history and used it to write many of her stories. When Robert returned home in 1969, it was to be understood he would work for the organization and follow in the path of his father, who took over the family business. And I use air quotes here because this isn't your traditional mom and pop family business. This is multi-million dollar uh, corporate, you know, bigwig. We're not just taking over something easy. This is extremely intimidating no matter who you are and comes with tremendous responsibility. But Robert, he had different plans. He was not cut from the same cloth as his father and his grandfather. Basically, in a nutshell, what I'm saying is he wanted to maintain the lifestyle he was born into, but not through corporate work. No, he wanted to start something of his own and for it to grow and keep him in the level of comfort that Silver Spoon afforded him from the, from the get-go. He started All Good Things, and there is a movie called All Good Things, and it does star Ryan Gosling and is loosely based on Robert and Kathy's life. The food store, All Good Things, was opened in early 1970s, a very small health grocery store in Vermont. In 1971, Robert's life would change, and what could have become for the better quickly spoiled like the produce in most of our refrigerators today? Robert met a young, attractive dentalist hygienist, Kathleen McCormick. Where Robert grew up with money just outside of New York City, Kathy grew up in New Hyde Park, close to New York City, and this was below the Long Island Sound, and Robert grew up north of it. So she didn't come from a well-to-do family. It was very blue-collar. They worked very hard for what they had, and they learned to appreciate what they had. Let me introduce you to Kathleen McCormick Durst. She was born June 15, 1952, to James and Anne McCormick. She was the youngest of four children. And like I said, James and Anne were very blue-collar Americans working hard for what they had. Very different from how Robert was raised. Kathy moved from her family home in New Hyde Park to New York City. And the apartment she was renting just happened to be owned by the Durst organization. There she met Robert. And in the fall of 1971, the two fell fast and hard for one another. So much so that on their second date, Robert asked Kathy to move in with him in Vermont. Robert and Kathy would move in together and into their Vermont home in 1972. From there, she continued on with her education. Come 1973, Robert had had enough of his father. He, he closed down all good things and Kathy and Robert moved back to the city and Robert began working for his father. His duties and responsibilities were light to start off with so he could learn the ropes, so to say. Seymour could see that his son's heart just wasn't in it, but he thought with time, Robert would give in and take on the company just like Seymour had. But in reality, Robert had other plans and it didn't include working for his father. On April 12th, 1973, Kathy and Robert married on Robert's 30th birthday, and many believe the couple were something to compare to. They were in love. Both were good-looking. No doubtably would they make beautiful children. But behind closed doors, the pair had come to a, a decision together that children were not something that they wanted in their future. Kathy agreed to Robert that she would abort any pregnancy she may have during their relationship. Their pact to not start a family wasn't the only thing going on behind closed doors. Now that it seemingly he owned Kathy because they were married, he changed. And he had zero interest into doing anything that Kathy might 
possibly be interested in. Basically, if it wasn't his idea, he didn't want to partake in it in any form or fashion. And he detested any interaction she struggled to get him to do, to be a part of. He, you know, she was just like, please come with me. And he, he set out going, I'm going to hate it. And he hated it for every minute until they were gone. In the documentary, The Jinx, you can find that on HBO Max. Robert said that Kathy's mother only ever cared about what he thought. She was looking to become a sociolite through association, is what he was basically saying. What did Robert want? What did Robert say? What did Robert approve? Was all that he said and could ever say about him when he and Kathy were in her presence. In his eyes, Anne and her family, including Kathy, were beneath him. I'm not joking. He even included his wife in that statement. During their marriage, Robert became very demanding and abusive. And it doesn't surprise me that Robert was verbally abusive, even though there is no documentation or confirmation of his father being verbally abusive to either Bernice or the children. I feel like Life Home, while Robert was growing up, had some to be desired. You know what I'm saying? Robert's behavior had to be learned. It, I, I don't mean it had to be learned. It was most likely learned. This is the most plausible in the development of his actions and his thoughts. Robert and Douglas went through therapy and that possible diagnosis of personality decomposition and schizophrenia. They were still there. Those signs, those symptoms were still there. But at this point, Robert was old enough to confirm or not confirm whether or not he would be evaluated by anybody in the mental health profession. And he denied it every time. But I, I go through this and I'm, I'm, let me go ahead and just point out that I'm not licensed in any form or fashion, in any level of psychology. I studied it when I went to school. I found it very interesting. And the more I look at this case and the more I look at his actions and his responses, the more I'm saying he was schizophrenic. Like I said, I'm not a doctor. I can't legally diagnose him. I can just tell you what I'm seeing. And that, those signs, let me just say this. Those signs were picked up on early in this before I found out he, at a young age, had seen a therapist and they had those sneaking suspicions of their own. I was seeing schizophrenia in him before I really realized that anybody else had. So that doesn't mean to boost my ego in any way. I'm just saying that you look at this case and if you know just the basics of schizophrenia, you're going to be able to pick it out. He's almost textbook with that. This will play a role in how he deteriorates through his and Kathy's relationship. And we can see that there are signs, warning signs screaming for him to have help. But considering he was still very lucid, he was still very much in control of his own thoughts or it presented that way. There was little to be done, really, honestly. I do want to point out he's never been convicted of being a part of Kathy's disappearance. So let's just remember that now, okay? When Robert was in jail, he was serving time under different convictions, but they had reopened Kathy's disappearance and were looking at him strongly. As his relationship with Kathy progressed, so did whatever mental break he was having. He often questioned her faithfulness to him, questioned whether she respected him or was over time out to get him. It seemed as they grew and Robert's mental issues continue to develop, we see him break and in, in the level of trust that he should have for his wife, for his family. The family was already strained before Kathy came into the picture. 
Then Kathy comes into the picture as another level, and then we see that start to deteriorate as well. He cannot 100% give himself to trust anyone. There's always that sneaking feeling that they want something from him, that he is only good for one thing to them. So as Robert starts to question all of this about Kathy and her loyalness, he resorts to going from a vocally abusive to physically abusive. And it didn't matter whose company they were in. Robert and Kathy often threw parties in their home. One thing that Robert was sure of doing was partying. Some say that as long as he could smoke pot every day for the rest of his life, it wouldn't matter what else happened. Again, we can go back and we can look at that possible diagnosis. If he really did suffer from schizophrenia, smoking pot could help with the inner thoughts, with the inner voices. It may have helped him make it possible to think clearly without so much noise going on. So the best way I know how to describe what this could feel like when a person with schizophrenia is like their brain's on fire and they don't know which fire to put out first. So there's so much going on in their head and the people they're visually seeing, they no longer can trust. Hallucinations take over whether they're auditory or visual. All of it play a part into why the trust breaks down over time. But him smoking marijuana could possibly have helped him manage that as much as he could. He really needed to be on some medication, but you know, you don't want to be that person in your family. Many people remember attending parties with Kathy and, and Robert, and they enjoyed it. They had, Kathy would often invite over classmates from her nursing school where she was now, and when she got into medical school, some of those students would come to these parties at, as well. Some of them recall some of the verbal and seldom physical abuse that Kathy suffered, but if the party goers were more swayed towards the elite in New York, Robert seemed to mind his manners a little more than he did with those he felt like were beneath him. March of 1976, something happened to the couple that neither wanted, but once that second pink line appeared, Kathy began having second thoughts about what she and Robert had agreed on early in their relationship. Having a baby and that feeling suddenly just over came Kathy. She hoped that she could talk to Robert and show him that this was something they were both capable of doing, but in the end, Robert couldn't care less what Kathy had to say. They agreed no babies ever, and he meant it. Kathy was forced into an abortion. She entered into the facility of her own free will, but Robert made it almost impossible for her to choose anything else. He didn't want a kid out there that had his blood, whether they kept the baby or gave it up for adoption. He meant no baby ever when they agreed on this. And Kathy went through the abortion, but things changed for her after that. And those rose-colored glasses that she once wore to see Robert through were gone. And she was seeing him for who he had become since they tied the knot. And it was terrifying. She would spend time away from their home more and more, using the excuse of school to cover some of the truer reasons as why she was not coming home. But when in public, she still presented as a united front. They were a happy couple, and soon she would relax in the comfort of their being witnesses. But soon it didn't matter whether or not there was witnesses present. Robert didn't care. If he wanted to lay hands on her, he was going to, no matter who was there. In 1978, Kathy was accepted into Einstein School of Medicine, where she had planned to specialize in pediatrics. Even though having a family wasn't something that Robert wanted, Kathy 
felt like this could fill that void she was missing. She would stay at their country cottage on Lake Truesdale, and on the weekends, Robert would go out to the cottage and see her, and they would spend time together. During the week, he remained in the city, even though he really didn't want to be involved in his family business, he still was going through the motions. One thing about Robert in this family business was, as long as Robert had a position there, if Robert was out of the office and needed to call the office, he only did so in through collect calls, saying that he was working for Seymour. The reason he was calling was because of Seymour, and so he could pay for those phone calls. Robert had this weird thing about money. He wanted it to be at his disposal whenever he wanted it, but he really didn't overly care about materialistic things. He claims that Kathy very much cared about how they presented themselves and always wanted to have what they could afford. He said that she drove an older model Mercedes and it really bothered her that Robert wouldn't go out and buy a new one. They could financially afford to own a newer model car and they could live at a better means than what they were. But Robert didn't care about any of that. And this will go on throughout his life. He was very happy being the essentials for the most part. I mean, if he donned clothing, I'm sure it was clothing that wasn't from Walmart. But he wasn't your typical sociolite. He didn't have a home full of just things that cost an absurdly amount of money. And then shows it off to his friends. No. I mean, his as he could live in a in a studio apartment with nothing in it and nothing on the walls and be perfectly happy. But as long as he needed money, if it was there, that's all he cared about. So he wasn't part of that. And Kathy was. She was like, I don't understand why we're not living better when we can. Now, whether or not he truly didn't allow her to live at a better means or not, we'll never know. We've only got one side of the story. Things like this are he said, she said kind of details in a case like this. And the other side's not here to say, no, that's not what I said or that's not what I meant. And it makes it extremely difficult to really decipher some of those details. But they do need to play a part in the storytelling of the case because without them we have speculation of mental abuse we have or speculation of mental illness we have physical and emotional abuse we have so many of these little things that are making up the perfect little storm but it's these details that really solidify whether or not this is going to be the storm of the century, right? <clears throat> so that's why I bring in some of this stuff. Even though it's all very much he said, she said, hearsay, it still makes this case the interesting that it is. It still has the meat to it, I guess you could say. And like I said before, we look back and we can look at what Robert did after Kathy's disappearance and we can be like, yeah, some of these details that aren't confirmed make a lot of sense. Between being forced into an, an abortion that she was clearly not okay with having and Robert's deteriorating connection to the marriage, Kathy really sits down and begins to reevaluate the relationship that she's in and wonder if she had made the best decision that she could when she married him. Is it worth fighting for is what it comes down to. I can't see that it was ever about the money to Kathy. She grew up in a home where she learned to work for what she wanted and appreciate what she had. So when it came to evaluating this situation as a whole, I'm not really sure how much that money held her in place except for the fact that it kept her from having to take out student loans, which 98% of you listening right now probably have a student loan at one time. If you're not, you were drowning in it. 
and you can see the the glamour to, to staying in a situation that could afford you an opportunity to not owe tens of thousands of dollars just for your schooling and education, right? So no, it wasn't about the money, but I'm sure the fact that she wasn't putting herself in an exuberant amount of debt to go to medical school was a part of that plus column, okay? She was by no means a gold digger at all. There's no doubt in my mind. She just, that's just not who she was. She, she wanted to live where she could live and at the level that she could afford. Now, Robert, he's losing interest fast and the trips to the cottage are slowing down and outings she had with her friends where she hoped that he would accompany her were slim to none. If he did go out with Kathy and her friends, he was socially awkward, not really ever enjoying the things that were going on or that they were doing or that they were saying. He was happy as doing his own thing without a crowd of people being needed to have a good time. He was a loner. In spring of 1979, Kathy wrote in her journal that she and Robert, she called him Bobby. They arrived home late from a party. They were drunk. They argued. He slapped her. And these excerpts from her journals are beginning to be a timeline on when and where Robert's physical abuse began to gain strength and the occurrence of them. In fall of 1979, Kathy's diary reveals that the abuse was increasing. She writes, we were sober. We argued about some minor issues. He punched me. I fell to the ground, hitting my leg. In 1981, Robert was pulling away from Kathy quick, fast, and in a hurry, and the abuse was ramping up. Robert was becoming increasingly violent. The effort he was putting into compromising and working to make sure that their relationship lasted, it was plummeting. He was no longer working for the Durst organization despite his father's wishes. He was still placing collect calls to the office, but he was not doing any of his job duties. He wasn't even going in. He was just waiting for Seymour to say, get your ass out of here. Christmas 1981, Kathy's family gets together and this is when they're going to see firsthand how angry Robert could really get. He decided after a while he was done being at her mother's for the holidays, he was ready to go home. Kathy, she's having a great time with her family, talking, laughing, reminiscing. But when Robert asked her if she was ready because he wanted to leave, she said no. She wasn't ready to leave, that she was having a great time. Robert reaches up, grabs a fistful of her hair, yanks her back to him, and declares, leaving wasn't up for debate. They were leaving. He was done socializing with her family, and he wanted out. None of Kathy's family seemingly stepped up to the point of not letting Kathy leave with Robert. I couldn't imagine that no one didn't stand up and say, hey, no, that's not cool. I don't see everybody just sitting back and averting their eyes away, waiting for the awkward situation to be over. I don't. I just wish that, and I'm sure they do, I'm sure they do wish that they would have made Robert leave that night and kept Kathy with them. This would be the last time she would see her family in that gathering for the rest of her life. In the end, Robert and Kathy left the party, and we are up to January 1982, the month that she would go missing. On January 6, 1982, Robert beat her one night so badly it caused her to go to the emergency room with facial injuries. But rather than tell them what happened, she chose to protect Robert and tell them that she had fallen down. Along with not seeking to get Robert in trouble, she was also thinking about her career and her education and how it could affect her status at school. So instead of saying anything, she bid down, received treatments for the fall. We know it wasn't a fall. 
and went on about her way. Her best friend, Gilbert Naomi, I think is how you say her name. If I'm, I apologize. I'm horrible at pronouncing things. You know that. Moving on. She was really close with Kathy. Like I said, they were best friends. And she, at this point, is starting to help Kathy put together the things that she would need in order to hopefully win a divorce against Robert. Kathy realized that this was a toxic relationship and she needed out. But when you're splitting from a very prominent family, you need to make sure all your ducks are in a row before you let anybody know that's what your intentions are. There is one incident in Robert's past that really gave her some leverage and would help her prove that Robert was a violent man. Robert assaulted another man named Peter Schwartz. This should have landed him with a felony assault conviction, but as they dug in and found as Kathy's digging into this whole thing and as the situation's playing out and she calls and talks to Peter, she realizes they've settled out of court for pennies on the dollar and the charge on Robert was dropped from felony assault to disorderly conduct. It led with no jail time. So what could have really helped Kathy solidify not only the abuse, it just came out to be nothing. I had mentioned this before, but with Kathy's education being taken care of by Robert and his family, she was just four months shy of graduation in January of 1982. So the options were divorce, and with that assault conviction, it could have not only given her a leg to stand on to show that he was abusive, but a leg to stand on to say that this was a toxic relationship, but that her education should not have to suffer, and therefore they could reach a settlement that would pay for her the remainder of her college and the living expenses up until the point that she graduated. All of that could have come from that whole incidence with Peter Schwartz, but since that didn't happen... The likelihood she was going to win that in a divorce decree, slim to none. So now the option was keeping Robert happy until she graduated. She was going to divorce him, no question. The when she was going to divorce him, that was the, that was the unknown in this all. Kathy was beginning to see a side of Robert that no one had ever seen, and she began to really fear for her life in the last weeks of her being alive. So much so that one day she had had enough, her and Robert had been arguing, she decides to go to Gribet's house on a rainy afternoon. She needed to get out of the cottage. Things were just building up. While over there, her and her friend talked about what was going on at home and what she could do about the entire situation. Well, Robert's calling, you know, throughout the afternoon and yelling at Kathy for not being home because he was there. And over this whole thing with Peter Schwartz and the settlement and this, that, and the other. But Kathy stood her ground and she stayed for as long as she could. Into the evening hours, Robert calls yet again and yells at Kathy. And this time she, she says, I really need to go home. Robert's getting upset. But before she left, she turned to Gilbert and she said, if anything happens to me, check out Bobby. Then she left. Gilbert didn't know that would be the last time that she would see her friend alive. On January 31st, 1982, Kathy leaves a dinner party that was in Connecticut and returns to the couple's home on Hoyt Street in South Salem. Kathy and Robert get into yet another argument, and from what I understand, this is a very push-and-shove kind of argument. 
And what happens next is what we know per Robert. The two argued about something insignificant. She decided she was going to go back to the city and stay in the apartment. So Robert took her to the train station and dropped her off. She promised to call him once she arrived at the apartment and let him know she made it okay. Robert said that he received the call sometime after returning home. But according to Robert, when he pulled back up after dropping her off at the train, he went over to his neighbor's home, Bill and Ruth Mayer, and together they had a drink or two before he actually went back into their home in South Salem. Once home, Kathy phones and says that she's made it to the apartment and that she would call him sometime later in the week. Hence why it took almost five days before he reported her missing. According to the doorman at the couple's apartment building, he remembers Kathy coming in that evening late and headed straight for the elevator and went up to the apartment. According to Einstein School of Medicine, Kathy called in that following day to the assistant dean, Albert Kupperman, saying that she was ill and wouldn't be into school that day. Well, come February 5th, 1982, Robert Durst calls the police in Manhattan and reports his wife missing. Let me repeat that. He calls the police in Manhattan to report his wife missing, not South Salem, where he was and where that is the last time he physically laid eyes on his wife. No, mm -mm. he calls where he presumes she was last at. Why is this a big thing? You change the jurisdiction of how this is handled by doing that. Just FYI. So automatically you're pulling the attention away from where the crime scene is actually. Okay. In the days leading up to the report, Robert began doing something that we would say is a little suspicious. He was throwing away Kathy's personal effects, dismissing all the mail that came in that was addressed to her by pitching it in the garbage. And once investigators really start to look into her disappearance, this comes up and they mark it as being odd or strange because it is. But thanks to Robert turning to his best friend from UCLA, Susan Berman, things in this investigation kind of went differently than it should have. Come to find out, Susan was the one that is thought to have called into Einstein Medicine the following day after Kathy disappeared, thus changing the timeline of when somebody last saw or spoke to Kathy, okay, changing the investigation again, and instead of tracing her steps from the time that she left the couple's home in South Salem, it changes it to the couple's apartment in Manhattan following the Monday. The other thing that Susan stepped in and did to change the course of this investigation is give investigators tips on Kathy being a habitual drug user. Her drug of choice, cocaine, and the also elusive quaaludes that are no longer a thing. These both were drugs of her choice according to Susan. So now investigators are looking into the fact that she has a drug habit. How is she obtaining her drugs? How is she paying for her drugs? Is there, you know, a disagreement on how much she owed or was she in a significant amount of debt? Things like that start coming up. But Susan's not done. No, no. She goes ahead and tells investigators, okay, she's a drug addict. And now... She's promiscuous, and she hasn't been faithful to Robert for their entire marriage, so that also may help. So now we're looking at possible lovers that maybe between one of her, maybe they wanted her to leave Robert, and she said no, and they are the ones who killed her. What we do know now, many years later, is that Kathy did have an affair with a man named Bill Stevenson. Bill was freshly divorced from the now First Lady Jill Biden when he ran into Kathy. The two had been close prior to Kathy meeting Robert and had talked on and off throughout the years. 
But one thing led to another on this particular night, and Robert had been really bad to her, and Bill says that the two had slept together. Bill may have helped Kathy in the department of knowing whether or not she really wanted to still be in the marriage with Robert. That was probably one of the things that came most from her affair just days leading up to her disappearance. She may have realized it doesn't matter if I have to take out student loans to finish these next four months. It's worth it. I'm done. And that maybe the conversation that Robert and Kathy had that night that she disappeared, you know, the one that he says was insignificant. It may have been it. It, it helped her understand what a toxic relationship she was in. And that no matter how much she loved him, it was never going to be enough because he didn't love her the same. So she was done being tied down. That's where I'm landing looking at this whole thing. I think Kathy initially decided she was going to get the next four months by graduate in the marriage. But in a moment of weakness between her and somebody she was very familiar with, she had an affair. And for her, this really just brought to light that it's time to end the marriage now, no matter what the, the effects are later. This is toxic. I love him, but he doesn't love me kind of thing. Does that make sense? So I kind of think that's where this came together. She brought it up to Robert the night she disappeared. Robert wasn't about to be divorced. He wasn't going to let somebody take him to the cleaners and, you know, he had to pay alimony or whatever. And so instead of being like, shit, my marriage is over. It sucks. I'm going to drink until it doesn't hurt no more. He killed her. Plausible, right? <clears throat> In the end, the investigation was led to nowhere. Susan was now the spokeswoman for Robert. He avoided any and all questions coming from the media because now they had their hands on it and they've got questions. And, you know, you can say what you want to, but the media is pretty good about following leads. And just because it looks like the police aren't following that lead doesn't mean they're not. Okay. Let's just, the media is just more open about the direction they're going in. Eventually, Seymour Durst stops working with police in trying to help find his daughter-in-law. Robert hires himself a very fancy criminal lawyer, even though he and Susan tried to deter to the police and spin the investigation in any other direction than South Salem keeping Robert out of their line of sight or so they thought that was the whole plan of this. It was, it worked for a minute, but didn't work for a long time. Who gets rid of their missing wife's belongings? We've got that question. Throwing out mail, throwing out her personal effects, selling her car, you know, the one she couldn't get a brand new one because, you know, they don't spend money like that. Yeah, he sells it. So what man, hoping that his wife would be found because she's missing, would do something like that, right? However, we don't have a body. We can't prove what we fear happened. No one ever saw Kathy again. No body, no murder. Now, with the Durst family clamming up and hiring lawyers, it seems police have hit a dead end and their investigation grows cold for now.
It's been 40 years today since anyone last seen Kathleen McCormick Durst alive. The doorman later comes forward and says that he cannot be 100% sure that the woman he's seen in the late hours of January 31st, 1982 was Kathy Durst. A woman looking like Kathy Durst came into the apartment building that night and took the elevator to the Durst apartment. Who that woman could be could range from anyone, even to Robert himself. His ability to dress like a woman and be believed that he is one won't be the first time we see it in this case. Susan Berman was as loyal as they come. Some say just as her father was. So when Robert picked up the phone, told his best friend what he had done, there was no question that she was going to help him in his time of need. She took on the role in a way rarely seen and she helped a well-to-do serial killer get away with his very first murder. To this day, Kathy's case remains cold. Her body never recovered, and the person we all believe guilty of taking her from this world now gone before justice could be served in this life. We may never know what happened that night 40 years ago, but taking all that we know into consideration and fitting in the pieces together we know that there are some answers needed. In 2017, Kathleen McCormick Durst was legally declared dead 27 years after her husband divorced her due to spousal abandonment. He was free to move on with his life while she lay somewhere waiting to be found. Maybe one day the McCormick family will finally have some justice even though there is no one to prosecute as a guilty person for killing her and the person guilty of helping them cover up the murder is gone as well but the comfort in knowing she's no longer trapped in the nightmare that was her marriage she could be laid to rest peacefully and would provide comfort to the family in a way they have not had since kathy was last seen walking this earth Join me next week as we watch Robert fear a moment and a person capable of taking him down for the murder of Kathy and taking those matters into his own hands, rocking the world with yet another breaking headline. Again, he would seemingly get away with murder. Only this time, there is no one there covering up his mistakes. And eventually, someone is going to come knocking. Just a little reminder, Patreon is up and running, so head over there and check out what TTCL has to offer you. And as always, I leave you with one last line. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Much love, the true crime librarian.